Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, today we're very fortunate to have Mike Vopi from Index Ventures. Uh, Mike needs no introduction, but here's an introduction anyhow. <laughs> Mike joined Index in 2009 to help establish the firm's San Francisco office with Danny Reamer. Mike invests primarily in infrastructure, open source, and artificial intelligence companies. He's currently serving on the boards of Aurora, Cockroach Labs, Confluent, Elastic, Khan, Sonos, Zora, and Wealthfront. Mike was pre previously a director of Blue Bottle Coffee, Hortonworks, and Pure Storage. And he currently also serves on the board of Fiat Chrysler Automotive. Mike held several exec executive positions prior to Index, including being the chief strategy officer of Cisco's routing business. Or I'm sorry, uh, the chief strategy officer of Cisco, as well as the SVP and GM of their routing business. Mike managed a P&L in excess of $10 billion in revenues, and his team was responsible for the acquisition of over 70 companies, some of which were multi-billion dollar deals. Mike has a BS in mechanical engineering and MS in manufacturing systems engineering from Stanford, and an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He currently serves on the global advisory board of the Stanford Knight Hennessy Scholars Program. Please join me in welcoming Mike. I think I wrote that one myself. It's, it's, it's very good. Lots of accomplishments. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for joining us. Pleasure. Um, so to start things off, I mean, I think it's really fascinating that you grew up until you were five in Milan and then moved to Tokyo before the U.S. So how did growing up in Milan as well as Tokyo shape who you are today? Yeah. yeah. Well, any Italians in the room? Just checking. Okay, none of you. That's too bad. <laughs> Half. Okay, that's better than zero. Um, I think... The stereotypes are actually pretty accurate. So Italians and Japanese are really, really different. And, and they're, about, they're about as different of two cultures as, as you can get. Uh, Italians are loud and boisterous and like to talk and are highly extroverted. And they never have a subject where they don't have an opinion. Um, Japanese are quiet, thoughtful, conformist, um, very shy, introverted people, hardworking. Italians a little less so. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of lessons you need from, and to give you a snapshot of my life, right? I grew up in Italy. I was a regular Italian child. My family moved over there. And so we lived in the middle of Tokyo and I would wander the streets and have Japanese friends and live in a Japanese society. And then I would walk in home and it would suddenly turn into Italy with my mom yelling at me and my brother doing all this stuff. So I think what it, and I went to an American school, which is why I sound the way I do. Um, I think the biggest thing it taught me was adaptability and the ability to engage with very, very different people with different cultures, different objectives, and so forth. And I think it's one of the greatest gifts that I've ever had either personally or as a professional, which is just meeting people where they are. And um, uh, I think when you do that, you're able to obviously work with a lot of different kinds of people. but um, People also bring out their best because they appreciate the fact that you're meeting them where they want to be. Um, and I think it's helped me. I've had a varied career, right? I, I, was, I did corporate development and I sold products and I was a leader of an R&D team, pretty big R&D team. I've been a venture capitalist. I've been a CEO. So I've done a lot of different things. And probably one of the universal things that's always helped me in every profession that I've ever done is that ability to connect with very different kinds of people, people that are really different than me. Um, and so I think that that's an enormous gift that I got up from my upbringing. Mm. So you're more Italian or Japanese, would you say? <laughs> well, I am six foot three. <laughs> uh, I think on balance, I'm probably a little more Italian, but if you, if an Italian meets me and talks to me, they will find me pretty introverted and like relatively subdued compared to them. And you know, in Japan, they think I should be on television. So. <laughs> There you have it. I'm never at home anywhere. That's the, that's the <laughs> that's net net. <laughs> um, that's awesome. And so is, you, you know, you're an amazing leader. And so throughout this career of yours, what, what were you imagining doing when you were growing up in Tokyo? And what were you, let's say, later on in life, as you were graduating from Stanford, how did you envision your career to shape out? Uh, I mean, I, I, was a, I was a regular kid. So basically, I liked science, math, and stars when I was a kid. So I, I wanted to be an astronaut. Um, 
my mom dispelled me of that because it turns out that if you have Italian citizenship, it's awfully hard to be an astronaut. <laughs> They're mostly American, as it turns out. Uh, but I, I just like that kind of thing. I liked rockets, and I liked airplanes, and I liked you know, whatever. So not surprisingly, when I went to college, I became a mechanical engineer because I just liked those things. And I think like a lot of people that, you know, you graduate with a mechanical engineering degree, I went to work for HP. They made lots of physical objects. I worked on optoelectronics related products at HP. Um, as a mechanical engineer, are there any mechanical engineers in the room? Probably not one. Okay, so what does a mechanical engineer do? You go and you use CAD CAM tools and you design stuff. And you spend your day staring at a screen designing objects. And um, one of my great gifts in life is that I have a little bit of ADHD. And it's very, very tough for me to spend a full day of 10 hours or 12 hours sitting behind the screen designing things. And so uh, uh, even though I kind of like my work after as a design engineer for a couple of years, I sort of said, like, I, I can't see myself doing this for the rest of my life. Like, I want to do something different. And what I was, I was always very curious to say, like, my bosses would tell me, you need to design this. And I would, I would do the work, and then I would go, like, why, why am I designing this? What, what's the purpose of this thing that I'm designing? And as a mechanical engineer, like software engineers, you're very gifted because you get to write a program from top to bottom and it does a lot of things. As a mechanical engineer, like your first job is like the latch on the toilet door on an airplane, right? That's your project. It's like the masterpiece. So it's, it's, it's very low level and um, I think I felt like I wasn't getting the meaning of what I was doing. It, it wasn't meaningful to me. And it was tedious. So at some point, I went to my boss, and I was like, um, this is just not, you know, it's not what I want to do. He said, well, you're, you know, you're a smart guy. And, you, know, you like business stuff. I went to business school. You should go to business school. So after three years of work, he, he, was my, he recommended me. A bit. I went to business school because of him. And business school was a huge opening for me for two reasons. One, I sort of realized that I loved business. I really enjoyed understanding how things worked, why what the driving forces were behind, uh, you know, why is revenue important, costs, and this and that, and how do you produce those selling strategy, how do you do marketing, organizational behavior, incentives, human resources. I was fascinated by all that. I loved the kind of the systems nature of business. And then the other lucky stroke is that I was the co-lead for the high tech club at the GSB at Stanford. And our second year, we were holding a conference. We were inviting all these speakers and uh, three of us were co-heads, and one of my partners was a software engineer, and he said, you know, this is back, like, most of you probably were born in 94, but this is back in 94, and there was this, he goes, there's this thing called the Mosaic Browser. It's like super cool, and you can go to like the Louvre with it. And I was like, oh yeah, it's great. Well, how are we gonna use it? And he goes like, okay, so you know how normally how we make posters? We're not gonna make posters this time. We're gonna make a website. I was like, okay. How do you do that? He goes like, we're this language, it's called HTML. It takes you about 15 minutes to learn it. So we did a little website for the thing. We had a little email address where people get taught, and it was, the conference was a huge success. And all three of us were like, holy shit, this internet, it's gonna destroy the brochure business. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so there we were like, oh, that's our career right there. We're gonna destroy, we're gonna disrupt the brochure business. Um, uh, at the time, though, this is 94, so uh, Yahoo was a 1995 vintage company. eBay was a 1995 vintage company. There were no internet companies. So it was just Netscape, or Mosaic, which eventually became Netscape, and that was about it. And so one of my, my buddies got a job at Netscape. Uh, the other guy is Ariel Poehler, who's a prolific uh, angel investor, and he did a company called iPro that got acquired by Comscore. And I was like, shit, you know, what am I gonna do? And then I started going down the path of like, uh, okay, there's the web and the web runs on the internet and the internet is made of routers. So I looked up a, a bunch of people in the alumni directory from the business school and it turns out, lo and behold, the CEO of Cisco works, it was a GSB alumni. So I cold call him. At the time, he didn't email people, he just cold call him. So I cold call him, talked him into seeing me for half an hour. He was kind enough to see me a couple weeks later, I had a job, and then I ended up staying at Cisco for, for, uh, for 14 years. Uh, and you know, I went to work for the company when they were about 1,000, and I left when they were 55,000. So uh, just a phenomenal personal growth experience through that cycle, which you know, 
you know, I, I was lucky enough to do very early in my life. Okay. So two questions there. The first would be, there, there tends to be this philosophy in the Valley, which is very much negative business school. I'm assuming, depending on the situation, you don't, you don't buy into that. You think there is value in going uh, to business school, potentially? Uh, for a small, select group of people, I think it's a good idea. And I, I will juxtapose the difference. This, everything is contextual, right? right? So when I went to business school, uh, there was no internet. So if, if I wanted to learn something like marketing, I had to go buy a book and read it, like literally a physical book. I, I know this is like different for you guys, but... Uh, the internet was not disrupting the, the book industry. Yeah, and at the it's time, not short. so much. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, actually going to business school was actually a, a super useful thing for an engineer to pivot their career and so forth. You know, for you guys, for most of you, you have uh, advisors and blogs and YouTube videos and like, you know, 80% of what I learned in business school, you could learn, you know, on free online. So I actually think like my kid, I have a son who's a software developer and I have a daughter who's a, who's a sophomore in college. She'll figure out what she'll do. I don't think they should go to business school. It doesn't make any sense for them in the modern era. I don't think I would go to business school in the modern era. However, there are a set of people like, let's imagine that you're a super smart kid, but you decided to become a Navy SEAL and you want to pivot your career in the tech. Well, business school might in fact be a very good idea for you, right? But I think for the large part of the Silicon Valley community, I think it's much less useful than back in there when I went. Got it, got it. Um, and it, so going back to Cisco, so when you first joined, Cisco was doing what, like a billion dollars of revenue? Yeah, uh, actually 500 million. 500 yeah. million. Yeah. And then when you left in 2007, it was doing 34, 35 billion? Yeah. So that's pretty good. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, any good stories from that, from that basically 10 to 1,000 phase where of hyperscaling, mistakes made, um, memorable leadership lessons? There's, there's many. Uh, I'll sort of give you uh, a, a personal lesson, which also translates into a business lesson. Because, I, I mean, I could go on forever, but we have limited time. So probably the, the most important lesson, and the phase you're asking me about is this sort of the scaling phase of life, right? right. So we had product market fit. We knew the product was selling and so forth. But the, the, I think the challenge that most companies and most people at the same time face is that they define who they are in too narrow a way. They, they, they kind of think of their job, because when you're getting started, a narrow definition is incredibly important, is what's called focus, right? Focus is really, really, really important when you're getting started. But focus can be your enemy later on, because if the area that you happen to focus on is a space this big, at some point, you can't grow past that. You're constrained by the space that you're in. And so the thing that I really learned at Cisco, and this was very much, it wasn't me, I was just watching my managers and the executives do this, is redefining the playing field, right? If your playing field is this big, it's no longer this big, it's this big. So find adjacencies, move into new market segments, define new competitors, change who you are, and obviously build an organizational structure and an organizational culture to be able to continuously redefine who you are in a growth mode, right? Constantly expanding is, is super important. And many, many times Cisco could have been a $5 billion company or it could have been a $10 billion company. I think today it's got a 250, 300 billion market cap. And that all didn't happen day one. Like it was not predestined. Cisco went public at like a $500 million valuation. It wasn't even worth a billion. And a lot of the value was created later on by just continuing to expand. And it's important to keep in mind that contrast because when you start, you wanna be focused. But later on, if you're too focused, you narrow your playing field. That lesson is the same for people. People tend to define themselves as I am this, I do this and I'm good at it. And if, people get comfortable doing that. But that can be very, very constraining. And so I saw, like, the employee count is an interesting thing. So I joined at 1,000 employees. Seven years later, we were at, like, 25,000 employees. And almost everybody that was my peer had gone up, like, one or two levels, but had not managed to scale all the way up to being an executive VP or a senior vice president. 
And the problem is they, they, they did one thing and they did it incredibly well, right? They were a software developer or a marketer or a salesperson and they were exceptional at that. And they had been so successful doing that one thing that they kept doing that one thing the next year and kept doing that one thing the next year. And the problem is organizations, grow, growth is a good thing, right? It's success. But when they grow, they need something different from you. And people fall back to, that made me successful last year, so I'm going to do that again. And then they get all bitchy, like because four years into it, it's like, this place is nothing like the place it was four years ago. It's like, no fucking kidding, we're 10 times the size. <laughs> right? so, so the ability to, to constantly redefine who you are and expand your playing field as a professional. So gain broader skills, manage people, change functions, work on different products, expand your technical skill set. Like just do more is super, super important because if you're on a rocket ship, you gotta keep redefining your job. You can't keep doing the thing that you were doing last year. Hmm. And so going off of that, it almost seems like, you know, when you first joined Cisco, you were helping out with corp dev, is that correct? Yeah. Um, and within, I think less than three, four years, you became, uh, you became the chief strategy officer. Yeah. So obviously a lot of that was the fact that Cisco was going through this hyper growth phase, but you also seem to have this in, innate ability to both know where to go after opportunities, but also manage up. How, how did you go about that process in terms of managing people higher than you at Cisco when you first joined and getting more opportunities to just try new things? Um, I don't know that I was particularly good at managing up. Like, if I had you read my reviews yeah. from the time, um, I don't know that people would have said I was the best at managing <coughs> up. I, I think what happened was when thing, companies grow, vacuums are created, right? Because, like, you have, space opens up and you've got to fill it, right? So if you go fill it, some people around, they look at you and they go, like, oh, yeah, you filled that space, let's just give them the job. So, you know, I came in as an individual contributor, and we were, uh, particularly in corp, to have a time we were buying all these companies. So my boss came to me and said, you know, you're doing enough of that, why don't you hire a couple people? So then I was a manager. I was like, okay, great, and I managed a bit, and we did more of those. And, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time, I always had a passion for the product side of things, so I spent a lot of time with product people. And then my manager came to me and said, you know, you're actually pretty good at connecting with, even though you're a corp dev guy, you're pretty good at talking to the product people and understanding the strategy and what's going on in the market. Do you want to also do strategy work? So I had now M&A and strategy. And then, you know, they keep giving, kept giving me stuff because I was always curious and I connected with people and all that. So um, I think more than managing up, it's like finding vacuums in the organization, open spaces, like work needs to get done, nobody's doing it, just jump in and do it. Mm -hmm. And if you do it well enough, they'll give you the space. Mm -hmm. And I, obviously better, comp I think it's one of the things that makes good companies and bad companies. Good companies are very good at allowing people to fill that space and own it, right? Bad companies will say like, yeah, you're too junior, right? Um, and I think that that's, you know, a lot of great companies are built with people that are too junior. Yeah. <laughs> So it seems like the, the two skill sets are curiosity and building trust with people and just that interpersonal relationship. Yeah, that and the, the sort of the, the forward leaningness to jump on the grenade, right? right? Like fix the problem. Gotcha. Um, while you were at Cisco, while you were acquiring these companies, th this is a pretty interesting time. I mean, this was mid to late 1990s, uh, which is the dot-com bubble brewing and eventually collapsing. Yeah. And you acquired more than 70 companies. What, what was that experience like? I was super cool. I made a lot of venture capitalist friends. <laughs> <laughs> made them very wealthy. Uh, we were paying a lot of money for these companies. Uh, I mean, it was kind of go-go days, like, you know, everything. I mean, a little different than now, but in some ways also similar. Uh, valuations were going sky high. There were tons of new VCs that were coming around. Uh, a lot of strange things getting funded. Um, uh, a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs getting wooed away from our company. Hiring engineers was was difficult. One of the reasons we acquired so much, it was really hard to keep pace. Uh, so uh, we were acquiring people. So it was a fun time. I, I, I'm I'm not one to say like, oh, looking back, I knew something was wrong. Uh, something was wrong, obviously in retrospect. So uh, you know, in 2000, 2001, there were some pretty massive corrections to it. But um, I would say that we, you know you just go to work, you just go to work and you're just sort of immersed in the problems of the day, and um, you are you, because the default answer in, in the world around you is yes, 
you can do a lot of things, right? The, bi the big difference in, in good times like today or like back in the 90s when there was a bubble is that the default answer to anything you do is yes. Oh, you want to pursue that idea? Yes, that's a good idea. Let me give you some money. Oh, you want to hire this person? Yes, go hire that person. You want to spend extra this month? Yeah, go spend extra this month. Everything is yes. It's fun to work in that environment. There's other times where the default answer is no, and it's a little less fun to work, but it's reality, right? So do you think we're living through another uh, late 90s? I don't think so, no. Uh, I, I, I do think that there is an infusion of capital and, and um, you know, there's a lot of valuations that are quite high, but I do think that in the end game, not, not at a Series A or a Series B, but if you look at companies that go public, and how the public markets value them. I think there's a reasonable amount of rationality. You know, great businesses get valued like great businesses, not so great businesses get punished. So I think there is some level of euphoria, particularly in late stage financing right now. I do think that ultimately we are building lasting differentiated businesses and that they are being valued somewhat realistically, particularly at the later stages in their life as public companies, right? I mean, You've seen what happened to WeWork. Uh, you see what's, uh, you know, the not so happy life that Uber or Lyft has had as public companies. And on the other hand, you see companies like Twilio or Atlassian or Zoom doing extraordinarily well and people recognizing what those companies are worth. Going back to your Cisco days for a second, I don't know how accurate this is, but uh, from many sources, there seemed to be this idea, especially in the mid 2000s, that you were the CEO in waiting at Cisco. Um, and that ultimately, potentially, one of the theses is you left Cisco because you realized John Chambers was going to stay there for much longer, which he did for another nine years after you left. Uh, but then from other sources, you also said, you know, I don't like managing a lot of people. That's just never been my thing. So number one, did you ever expect to be CEO? And number two, if that's the case, how did you, how did you maintain composure or leadership in that environment while waiting for him to potentially leave? Yeah, no, not so much. I, I think uh, the reason I, I never really thought of myself that way, particularly because I was young mm -hmm. and a lot younger than a lot of my peers. So I really didn't think about it that way. The ultimate reason why I left is like, it, kind of like a midlife crisis, basically, right? So I, as I gave you the early story, like I was an engineer, I went to business school, I landed at this company, I thought I'd be there a couple years, this thing exploded, it got really large, I built friendships there, I made a lot of money. And so I was like, okay, this is great, I'm doing this. And then I actually turned 40. And it was sort of, you know, whenever you hit milestones in life, they're kind of significant and you ask yourself, is this, is, is this what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life? And I, I didn't see it, I, I, I just, the, it wasn't so much that I didn't like, I actually like engaging with people, I like managing people, I just didn't like the, 50,000 people with the processes and the politics and the committees and the councils and the matrix organizations and the you know pe personal agendas being ahead of the it was one of those like I would I can't see myself doing this for another 15 years right and so uh, that was really the big reason why I decided to move on and I actually left it a super friendly way I ended up doing an EIR stint for six months at, uh, at Sequoia, actually. They introduced me to a company, ended up being CEO there. And I was much happier as CEO of a 100-person company um, than I was at Cisco at the end cycle. But it's funny, like when you grow up in a company, it's like, part, it's like, a, as, it's like a dysfunctional family. You know, it's, still, it's all fucked up, but it's still your family. <laughs> um, so you have a lot of patience for the nonsense. Uh, and so I think I probably overstayed my welcome there, but anyway, it worked out. Hmm. How, how'd you, I mean, I've always been curious about this. So you were there for a long time, and that became part of your identity for a while. Yeah. How long after leaving Cisco did you, were you still kind of getting over that phase of your life? Uh, publicly, I still get it, yeah. right? And, you know, uh, I, the, you know, as you grow older, I'm 53 now, as you grow older, you sort of figure out who you are more and more all the time. And I'm, I'm a generalist that loves to learn new stuff. That's who I am. And so when people, you know, I'd left Cisco and people would pigeonhole you, oh, you're the guy at Cisco that did X, Y, and Z. You're the guy. And I was like, mm, yeah, okay. Yeah, well, that was my job at the time, but I'm not that. 
And earlier in my life, because, you know, so I, I lived in Japan a bunch of years, so I speak Japanese. And so everybody's like, oh, you're the guy that does Japanese, and that's who you are, right? Remember earlier I was talking about redefining your playground? That's my motto in life. I'm always like, how do I reinvent myself? Yeah. And so actually inside me, when I was 40 and I left, I was like, I'm reinventing. This is like a new, phase, new chapter in life, whatever. It almost angered me when people would sort of go back to like, that was you and that's how we pigeonhole you. Mm -hmm. I became a VC a few years later and then people just kept pitching me on networking deals. And I'm like, I don't wanna do networking <laughs> deals. Like, you know. Um, so actually I found it to be a burden. Mm. Um, and you know, as often as I could, I would try to shed it. Like now as a VC, I, I've done a lot of open source investments um, and I'm happy to talk about those if those are of interest. But um, People say, oh, you're an open source investor. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm just an investor. I can do all sorts of, I can, I'm a learning being. I can learn new things. I can change. I can watch YouTube videos just like the rest of you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how, how I've, I've dealt with it. And I, I love changing. It's just th such an important part of, I think, everybody's life. Hmm. Yeah, let's dive into the, uh, the open source Companies. Okay. I I, th I thought it was really interesting how you described how you first got into open source, which was you know Warren Buffett has this philosophy, which is you got to be both a contrarian and you got to be right. And you thought it was very it was a definitely a contrarian move to do open source when you got into it. Um, can you talk to us about that framework? And then second off, you know in terms of open source specifically, you learn from Hortonworks that having open source projects without certain ways to monetize isn't potentially a great business. So can we also talk about the monetization of open source companies? Yeah, um, I, I think the gist of it was back when uh, we as a firm started, Index started investing in, in, in some of these next generation open source companies like 2011, 12, and the meme was, how do you make money selling free software, mm -hmm. right? So. Uh, the, the first thing I, uh, you know, I sort of uh, had this thesis was that developer-led models, which open source builds itself on that, were very, very important. And uh, the realization that open source was really sort of almost like a freemium mechanism, right? You have certain people that will pay you for it because they want advanced features, and there are certain people that will never pay you for it. Typically, smart people don't pay you, but there's a lot of people who aren't as smart that need to pay you, right? That was the thesis. Um, and a lot of people, even VCs wrote articles like, ah, oh, it's stupid, Red Hat's the only one, that doesn't happen, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I thought, well, this is interesting. If, if I can convince myself that uh, we can make money in open source, I'll be one of the few investors that does this. And that's great, because everybody, I won't have competition. It's very good. Um, and, and so at the time, Hadoop was like a big thing. And so I looked at a bunch of Hadoop companies, and I convinced myself to invest in Hortonworks because it was a little earlier stage than Cloudera at the time. Uh, and it was a slog, a total slog. And I was trying to, you know, one approach would have been to just say, fuck it, this open source thing, it was a bad idea to start with. Uh, the other one was to try to understand why it was such a slog. And so I started sort of just double clicking on all the different parts of the business model. And, you know, I, I came to a few conclusions, right, which is that in open source, when you're building a business, the very first business model you have is to sell support for that product. If you don't have the experts who wrote the software, you don't have the credibility to sell support. Very simple. So an open source business where the father or the mother of the open source isn't in the business is not very monetizable. Most of the originators of Hadoop were at Cloudera. They weren't at Hortonworks. And so we have a very hard time getting the machinery going. Like, just very hard to get the, the business model actually working. Um, the second thing is, it's nice that it, we call it freemium and it sounds all cool, but what it really means is about 90% of the people that use your product don't pay, 10% do, right? So if you start with a very niche product, you're not gonna have enough people that you monetize. You, ha you have to, if you, wanna, if you wanna have a cool open source project, by all means be my guest, but if you wanna build a business, you have to have the type of product that a lot of people use, right? And that tends to default on the basic elements of 
uh, of business and, 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 and software infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Databases, message buses, uh, uh, database query engines, um, uh, orchestration systems, something that everybody has to have everywhere. Of course, in the early days, it was operating systems because everybody has to have one of those. So w as you start getting super niche like a statistical analytics package, you just don't have enough 10% people to make money on it. So it's not a very good open source business, right? So that was kind of another important realization. And then the fourth point, which I think is super important, is the whole idea behind open source is you went to make the developer your evangelist. Hmm. So in a good open source company, developers are your marketing department. You should have no marketing department, and everybody out there that's using your product should be sitting there tweeting away of how amazing your product is. Because they don't pay you, but they talk about you. So you're, that, that's marketing. Which means you gotta have a product that a developer can sort of embrace and love. Right? If you have a product that's sold to an IT manager or sold to the marketing department, much harder to build it because you don't have that megaphone that the developer brings to the table. And so a lot, you know, there's a lot of people that come saying, oh, we have an open source CRM product. I'm like, yeah, but CRMs are not really used by developers. And so you're not going to have that megaphone. All you're doing is you're just letting 90% of your customers not pay you. Right. So it doesn't work for everything. But for certain things, and I guess the right answer is, certain conditions have to be met to build a good open source business. And just diving back before even the open source business in general, how do you find most of your investments? I, I think it's fascinating that you found Elasticsearch because SoundCloud. Yeah, I mean, there's a look as a VC. There's you, whatever way you can find them, you find the deals, right? But, Twitter. Uh, uh, Twitter, people knocking on your door, sending you mail, homing pigeons, anything. <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, what uh, I always, I, I do a few investments that are more consumery, um, uh, and sometimes uh, those, the people, the technical people on those consumer businesses, tend to tell you the stuff they're most excited about. Uh, I was at a board meeting at SoundCloud. So, see, all of you probably know what SoundCloud is, right? It's like a music service. And one of the big problems is because it's all UGC, discovery is really hard. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of really cool music on SoundCloud, but nobody can ever find it. So the CTO had been working on a new discovery mechanism with filters and a bunch of other stuff that would really help people discover it. Excitedly in the board meeting, he's like, we deployed this thing called Elasticsearch, and we put these... Uh, new discovery mechanisms in place, and the average user listens to 40% more music than they did the week before. Yeah. And I was like, 40% more? I mean, that's, and SoundCloud at the time was pretty big, so I was like, that's a, that's a massive, massive improvement. It's like, what is this thing called Elasticsearch? So I had heard of Lucene. Uh, if those of you, some of you know what Lucene is, it's li li open source libraries that are the underpinning of search. And I was like, oh, that's cool. So what is it? And told me about it. And it's like, this, there's this guy, uh, this guy called Shai Bannon, who wrote it. And he's a developer who's starting a business in Amsterdam. And you know, I was in, the SoundCloud headquarters were in Berlin. So that afternoon, I booked a flight, went over to Amsterdam. To, I said, can you introduce me to the guy? And I heard the story. And I was like, oh, this is really cool. So uh, one thing led to another. And we did that investment. Damn. Ha. I'm assuming you didn't do that while you were at Cisco, right? It, it wasn't no, just you heard. Was this was an index investment. No, but even when you were at Cisco acquiring companies, it wasn't like someone was like, yo, we got this really cool company, and you just flew to, to, to LA and just wrote a check. It, it was a much longer process. Depended, I wouldn't say. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you just got to go, right? Like you just, the, the, uh, um, I, I, I think uh, I'll answer the question this way because it's a good generalizable lesson. Um, as humans, evolution has taught us that mistakes are really bad, mm -hmm. right? Because when it was to be me and the lion, a mistake meant I was dead. Um, in modern society, mistakes are far less fatal. Uh, a bad investment usually doesn't translate to my death. Um, but we've retained that instinct to hate making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, anytime there's a business or there is a business project or something where you're more likely to fail, you tend to not do it, right? And I think what I, 
this is a lesson I think I learned partly in doing M&A stuff at Cisco because more than half of them failed. This is a lesson that we learn as VCs every day. We screw up investments all the time. But the, when you lose money, you can only lose your money mon once. When you make money, you can make it 100 times over. So actually, the cost of failure is very slight, and the cost of success is ma or the, the benefit of success is massive. And so you say, like, get on an airplane, go do a deal. Like, look, if it looks, it's a good looking deal, yeah, for sure. Like, you gotta go. You gotta do this stuff. And if it's like, if you're wrong, okay, you were wrong. But, um, you know, often you, you can get 20% of the facts and it'll tell you 80% of the story. And I think if your intuition says this is a good one, don't look for the nth degree of confirmation to avoid a mistake, but just do it. Mm. So basically, like Warren Buff has this thing of, his biggest mistakes in life were of omission versus commission. Is, is that what got you interested in being a VC? I think you know, a lot of things got me interested about being a VC. Uh, I think uh, you learn every day. Yeah. Uh, you get to hang out with amazingly smart people. It's a competitive business, so you know, I, lo I love the competition. There's some salesmanship involved. I always have to convince everybody to take my money instead of my neighboring venture firm. Um, uh, but I've, I've always been a person, or I've learned to become a person to not be afraid of making mistakes and being rewarded handsomely for taking certain risks. And that's the nature of the, that's my job. That's, that's the job description of a VC. Hmm. You know, uh, people will cite crazy statistics, but I think on average, a, a top tier venture firm, 30 to 40% of the Series A's, they do fail. And that's totally fine, because the, there's five that they did, 5% that they did, which will return 150 times their money, right? And that's the nature of the job. Hmm. Is, that, is that how you were framing it as in 2009, as you were going to London to work at Index London? Mm -hmm. And what was that? So what was the story of you joining Index, right? Because it seemed like you went to school with Neil or one of the Reamer brothers at Stanford. I, I knew those guys pretty well. I knew okay. the Index guys well. At the time, I was an EIR at Sequoia, and my company, Juiced, was a co-investment uh, between uh, Index and Sequoia. And I went two years, a very unhappy, uh, I learned a lot of things. It was not a successful startup. Uh, eventually ended up being aqua hired, essentially. Um, and both VCs were great. Uh, Index basically, as soon as we sold it, Index said, hey, thanks for losing $9 million of our money, but we think you'd be a good VC. Do you want to try this? <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, they've been very good board members. Uh, I had really enjoyed, my partner Danny Reimer was my board member and uh, I'd loved working with them. I thought I'd be cultural fit and you know they had this very interesting proposition to me which was Index at the time was a, a venture fund only in Europe uh, and they said hey why don't you uh, uh, come join and we'll start a US thing and I thought well that's cool it's kind of entrepreneurial I get to take a little bit of risk I get to work with a group of people that I like, and I've always been, you know, I wouldn't say that I've always been curious about being a VC, but I had experienced VCs firsthand as a CEO of a venture back company. I was like, I think I could do that job pretty well. So, yeah. And it's worked out. Were there any rough patches? And in, I mean, Index SF is essentially a startup of sorts. I, I think all of us, especially, you know, and anyone in the world go through rough patches in their careers and their lives in general. Were there any rough patches in starting Index SF, and how did you push it through? I wouldn't say that there were rough patches, but uh, I, I, it's safe to say that we were not particularly competitive in the very beginning. Yeah. You know, we didn't have a brand. It was literally like me and Danny and an admin in a, in a WeWork. It wasn't called WeWork at the time. <laughs> um, and, you know, we didn't exactly have a ton of credibility. So you had to lean on friendships, relationships, whatever, to kind of start stuff. Uh, both he and I were sort of generally optimists. And so I don't think we appreciated how, ma how much we sucked. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, make one investment, work your butt off to be helpful to the entrepreneurs, get a good reference, do another investment, did Hortonworks. It was an okay investment for us. I think we made three times our money. But didn't really kill it, learn, do one more, learn, do one more. I wouldn't say that I've ever had a day where I'm like, well, this really sucks. Mm. Uh, but I had days where, you know, you would work on a deal, uh, work with an entrepreneur, and they like you, and you know they like you, and then they say, you know what, we're going to give the deal to Greylock. 
And you're like, well, why? And he goes, like, because their name is Greylock. <laughs> and you're like, okay, that sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, that happens less these days. But um, yeah, but it, was, it wasn't the funnest. Mm. If you weren't being an investor at this moment, what would you be doing instead? Well, I got to think about that because I'm, I'm 53 and I'm not going to be an investor forever. Um, I'll give you two answers. The truth is, I've, I loved working in businesses and I've really enjoyed being a VC. Uh, if you told me, like, which do you like better, I can't give you a good answer. Um, I like both for different reasons. Uh, my startup didn't work and I have a little bit of a regret that I never gave it another shot. So I think I would have liked to give another startup go. Mm -hmm. But I'm also getting older and I don't think you have a lot of very good 53 year old entrepreneurs. <laughs> KFC. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, and so I think I'm thinking more, how can I give back in, in when I'm done with this gig? I care a lot about climate and uh, energy sources. So I, these days I read a lot about different forms of energy and so forth. But I don't think I can do that professionally. It's very hard to make money on re renewable energy as a VC. So it's, that's going to be more of a personal project at some point. Hmm. So deep diving to both of those in terms of both the first, the first answer, which was more entrepreneurial, you know, if you were to start a company today, what would it, what would it do? What industry would it be in? And then the second question is, in terms of climate change, would it be like a family foundation, or would it just be spreading more awareness that we are polluting the environment, or what would it specifically do? Uh, okay, so starting businesses, look, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time these days on AI and machine learning. Um, I think the reason is that, you know, if you look at the history of our industry, there are certain inexorable, very large themes that dominate phases. Uh, uh, the advent of the internet and the web was one of those. Uh, cloud has been one of those. Uh, mobility, uh, iPhones was another one of those. Mm -hmm. And I, at least today, I believe that AI and machine learning will have an equivalent tectonic impact on almost everything that we do. And I, uh, I don't know exactly what business I would build, but I would build it with that as a core and a foundation. Uh, so and not surprisingly, that sort of is very reflective also of the things that I tend to invest in these days. Um, I think, uh, so my nature is like a problem solver and I'm curious. And so I don't think I'd be a very good evangelist for raising awareness and all that. Um, these days, I'm particularly curious about nuclear power uh, and, um, one of the issues, that, I don't know how many of you guys like spend time on energy stuff, but um, wind and solar are great. The problem is that wind and solar are not constant, so you have to store energy or you have to move it around. Storing energy is very expensive because you've got to put batteries everywhere and they're not very efficient. And moving energy around is inefficient because the grid's not built to move lots of energy around from place to place. So solar and power aren't a great universal solution. Nuclear is, because you can have small plants and so forth, and largely nuclear technology, the power plants that exist in the United States are stuff that was designed in the 1960s. It's like arcane. So we haven't used anything modern to build nuclear power, nothing, not modern materials, not modern software, not modern technology, nothing to build them. And we go like, oh, we don't like those because they're not very safe. And I'm like, well, maybe we can try to build some that are uh, more modern and therefore more safe. Airplanes were also not safe at one point. It turns out they're pretty safe now. Um, so uh, there are geopolitical problems with that because no, you know, people perceive nuclear to not be safe and therefore they don't want it in their backyard. So you know, sort of solving that problem of how can we design one and how can we deploy nuclear reactors that are actually safe and, um, uh, and uh, help the energy problems that we have would be a very interesting problem to look at. Hmm. Interesting. Let's go double click on AI for a second. And I'm going to ask this question uh, kind of in a roundabout way by first asking, you're a big fan of music, right? I like music, yeah. yeah. Who's, your, who's your favorite band? Uh, you know, everybody has a favorite. I'm going to go sort of off track. So I listen to all sorts of different music. I, li I like a lot of jazz and piano music. So uh, one of my favorite pianists is an Italian pianist called Ludovico Inaudi. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. He's a fantastic pianist. And if you ever want to get some coding done, uh, I'd recommend sort of listening to his stuff uh, and, uh, and, and uh, zenning out. Interesting. I've got to check that out. Yeah. Not that I code, but hopefully I should pick that up. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so do you think 
AI one day will be able to produce music as good as Ludovico, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's as good as, but pretty freaking close. Uh, I think music is basically a set of patterns that our ears tend to recognize and connect with. Mm -hmm. Machine learning is like really good at recognizing patterns. And so I don't think that you'll get the most creative, but if you want some K-pop copycat, I, I'm pretty sure that AI or ML will do a pretty good job at it. Already, I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff that OpenAI is showing, mm -hmm. but that, I mean, to the untrained ear, and I think I would throw myself in that bucket, you can't tell. Got it. So, I mean, I think I was more going after whether they can learn the almost, you know, storytelling and human parts of music versus just pattern, but, but maybe that is pa pattern recognition after all. Well, I mean, let me put it this way. Are, are they going to write Beethoven's fifth? N not likely, but there's a lot of crap music that we listen to, which is just, <laughs> which is a lot of, which is a lot of copying of somebody else's riff, right? So, it, it, if you're it, if you're sort of just riffing off of a pre-existing set of modalities, it will do a good job at that. But it probably, again, not going to write the masterpieces for a while. That's fair. That's yeah, fair. I mean, what machine learning is pretty bad at is, you know, things that are deeply human, like emotion and intuition and so forth, which we all feel, but. They're, they're hard, to hard, to, uh, hard to comprehend. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, so let's, let's do some lighthearted last question. All right. Um, the question is, are you long or short the following companies? Yep. <laughs> <coughs> Flexport. Uh, I'm probably short. Google. I'm short Google. Facebook. I am short Facebook. <laughs> Shopify. Long. Amazon. Super long. Lam Actually, I'm really long in my personal portfolio. <laughs> <laughs> is, this uh, is this investment? <laughs> uh, Lambda School. Uh, I'm long. Brex. Uh, short. Salesforce. Long. AI. Long, obviously. We talked about that. The Warriors. I'm actually long the Warriors. <laughs> uh, I'm not a Warriors fan, but. <laughs> awesome. I appreciate this. This is awesome. Um, Thank you. We'd love to open up to questions. Yeah. Do you want to use the mic thing? Already. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. There you go. So uh, you talked a little about revenue <clears throat> and you talked about growth. Um, in terms of Cisco, you talked about growing quite a bit. You talked about growth with some of the different startups, but also sometimes you talked about revenue. So what do you actually look for between revenue and growth? Do you think one matters over the other? Or is it, you know, when you have that uh, feeling that you're in Berlin and you just want to go to Amsterdam and you're like, hey, this sounds like a good idea? Yeah, I mean, um, I think they're both important. Uh, uh, I think it generally, though, things tend to start with in the consumer world, you call it growth. In the enterprise business, we often talk about adoption. Adoption of a certain product starts first. Uh, uh, and it, to me, I, I think of it as like fertilizer, right? You got to put it in the ground, and then you can harvest it later. Um, growth alone, without the prospect of harvesting it, isn't particularly good. And some earlier, when we were talking about open source, uh, there's always a set of conditions that you should think about and say, like, can I harvest this later, right? So I don't think you have to be harvesting it today. You don't have to be getting that revenue today. But you've got to have an idea that's credible as to how in the future you're going to harvest it. And I'll give you kind of a concrete example. One of the notable, less than successful stories in open source is Docker, right? Docker was like a fucking rocket ship a few years ago. That's the one that, that gave it to Greylock instead of giving it to me. There's <laughs> <laughs> um, a rocket ship. Everybody's using containers. The problem they had is that the, a container itself is like super hard to monetize. Like you're not exactly going to pay somebody support on how to use containers, right? And so I think what they missed is they got, they got a lot of growth, right? But I don't know that they had thought through what the money-making mechanism, the, what the harvesting mechanism would be. And they were very slow at it. 
and then eventually Google came up with Kubernetes. And that, that would have been the magic. Like Kubernetes was the monetization method. They didn't think about it. And now Docker is like doing what they can to figure life out now, right? They, you know, they split it up and then maybe it's Docker Hub and who knows, whatever. But that's a classic like growth was important, but they forgot the harvesting bit. So, so you won in the end. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't do schadenfreude. Like it's not, other people losing is not my idea of winning. <laughs> What else? Let's pass the microphones back a little bit. Uh, so quite a few open source companies, including some of your investments, have recently changed their licenses um, to prevent some of the kind of big cloud providers from offering managed services. Do you think that's a result of kind of a change in the ethos around open source and kind of the respect that maybe some of these players had in the past of, you know, you're working on this open source project, we'll allow you to monetize that? Or is it more just, you know, as these cloud providers have looked for additional ways to grow their own business, they say, you know, why don't we get on, a, on this action? Uh, yes, I think the ethos has changed. And I do think that the second point you mentioned is also a very important one. Um, uh, I don't know how, how familiar everybody is with these license stuff, but most of the original uh, notable uh, open source projects were under an Apache Foundation license. The Apache Foundation license is relatively restrictive, which means that once you've contributed, it is really open in every possible way. Um, and what that allows uh, cloud providers to do, obviously, is to take that code, run it as a service, and hence you have you know, everything from Elasticsearch as a service, or you have Elastic MapReduce, or uh, Athena or Aurora or all these services that Amazon does. So they don't really do much in the way of contribution. They take the code, they run it, and then they end up competing with the company that's the author of it. Okay, so entrepreneurs are not stupid, and they say like, well, let's flip that license to one that's in a variety of ways more restrictive. And why do they do that? They do that absolutely to protect from the cloud providers taking away revenue, 100%, no doubt about it. But it is in some ways self-serving because it allows them to build a business. But it's also like, why would anybody want to, I mean, ultimately, there's an economic incentive. We're not in the business of altruism in Silicon Valley. We're, we are in the business of capitalism. And if there isn't an incentive to, to make money on your code at some point, if that's removed, you know, 95% of the people won't do it. Like, you know, 5% will just do it because it's good for humanity. But most of the rest of us are in this to make money. So it's self-serving. Yeah, one more back there. One last question on the open source yeah. thing. Do you, how do you think that will work out, the flipping the license? Like, do you think this will have a pretty big impact on things going forward? And related to that, do you see any other way going forward for open source companies to make, like to make large open source companies? Yeah, more profitable? Um, there's, there's actually an interesting prisoner's dilemma, right? Because if the people from Amazon ever decided to pay open source companies something for the privilege of using their code, uh, that would resolve the problem, right? People would be fine with the license. Amazon would pay you, and everybody would be happy. Amazon's an important distribution channel for what you do. Amazon doesn't want to pay, and so you change the license. And so what'll, if on the current classic prisoners dilemma, people can't agree, so you go down different paths. Amazon is basically going to write proprietary databases that mimic on an API basis, not databases, but projects that mimic on an API basis what the open source things look like. And the open source people will build their own clouds running on Amazon infrastructure, which are cloud variants of their service. So the prototypical example is MongoDB. Amazon runs a MongoDB service. MongoDB changes their license. So Amazon releases DocumentDB, which is a knockoff and sells it as API compatible with Mongo. Mongo launches its own cloud called Atlas, and now you have two clouds, which, with, which are 90% you know, feature compatible, which is no, uh, not a win for anybody, because developers are stuck, and like, you, know, you split the market into half, and so forth. But you know, Amazon wants to play that game, and you know, people will respond. So if you are asking me to predict the future, I think status quo. I think you're going to see more and more companies on the open source side have these funky licenses that prevent Amazon, and Amazon will pick off the projects and build their own copy of it and keep it proprietary. I think that's the outcome. Thankfully, um, Google and Azure 
both feel much more comfortable actually paying the open source companies because they're behind. And so they've been much more um, collaborative with open source businesses to actually launch the original item and do some kind of a revenue share. So if they do well, that'll put incremental pressure on Amazon, but I think it's little ways to go on that story. So, so thanks very much for doing this. Um, I, I guess the question is, infrastructure cycles tend to be really compressed in terms of you know, how quickly stuff can get disrupted. Uh, but when you look at this crop or cohort of companies, at least in the public markets, and even some of the stuff that's, that's late stage on the private side, um, you know, the way the, the valuation effectively either implies that markets are bigger than people previously expected, or the margin structure is going to be better, or the competitive advantage period is just going to be way longer than people suppose. And so I'm curious, you know, is it one of the three, two of the three, three of the three, all the three, none of the three? What's your sense? It's hard for me, on, you know, I'm not an equities guy, so it's hard for me to tell you whether Elastic is overvalued or Mongo is overvalued or, you know, Zoom is overvalued. It's a little hard to say. But I think generally businesses that have network effects have tended to have more staying power. Businesses that are technically superior have had shorter staying power, right? And that's true across any business. An enterprise business with network effects has a much, much longer life and an ability to sustain their competitive advantage. Enterprise businesses that are widgets or software tools that are better than the other ones tend to have low, shorter life cycles. So if I were to evaluate the businesses that are out there today, or if I were to start a business today, I would think hard about how, even in the context, we think of network effects as a consumer thing. They're, they exist very much so in the enterprise also. One of the reasons why Zoom is such a good company is it's an enterprise product, but it has network effects, right? So, um, uh, and, the, and there's all sorts of network effects. Twilio has a network effect because there are so many developers on it and they put tools on it and other developers can use it and so forth. So um, I, I think that the ones that do have those network effects may be even undervalued and the ones that don't may be overvalued. So if you were deciding to go pick stocks tomorrow, um, that would be my advice on long-term value creation. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, uh, one quick question here. Um, do you think there's too much money in pre-seed seed right now or not enough? Um, and I guess second question is, uh, besides AI and like infrastructure, uh, what, what kind of companies are you uh, looking to fund, um, if any? Yeah. Uh, is there too much or too little money? Um, Money is like water. It finds its sweet spot, right? So investment money shows up when people think they can make money at it. And there are temporal, like for some periods of time, there's a dislocation. Uh, so there's maybe too much money or too little money at times. But on over long periods of time, money's in the right place. The reason why there's so much money in this business, whether it's seed, pre-seed, A, B, C, D, whatever your favorite letter is, is because um, if you think about Money wants to find the best return it can, right? If you buy a T-bill today, you, you know, you're getting a percent and a half return per year, right? If you play the stock market, you know, you're probably making 10, 12% a year, and that's significantly above the average of what your public markets have done. Um, people have made a lot of money in venture, in all forms of venture, in seed, A, B, C, and D. And so not surprisingly, money shows up here. So I don't think there's too much. I think it's just, uh, it's just rational. And by the way, it sucks for me as a VC. I really wish there was less money out there. <laughs> but it is. It is what it is. And I don't think it's too little or, or, or too much. I think if you flip it from an entrepreneur's perspective, when there's a lot of money like there is today, you need to be very careful. Because people think of investors as a signal as to whether your business is or isn't successful or will be successful. So you get money and you think, wow, I'm on to something because these people that are supposedly experts are giving me money to pursue my idea. And it turns out we're not particularly good at it because as I said earlier, half the time we fuck it up. <laughs> so so I, as an entrepreneur, be very, very careful about reading signals, especially early on, 
because it probably tells more, it tells you more about whether you're a good storyteller than whether you're onto a good idea. So be very cautious in the environment, you know, especially if you're early on, which I think most of you are. What your job is to find product market fit, right? And product market fit is not a, a pre-series seed or a series A, whatever. those are not representative of product market fit. Product market fit is just customers loving your thing. And so don't, don't overread into whether there is or isn't too much money and whether you're getting funded, but focus on the mission of like, I gotta, get, I gotta make a product that people love. Uh, I'll repeat the question if you want. Oh, okay. Where are the boundaries shifting um, as cloud expands for data center infrastructure? If you're thinking about playing fields and adaptation. Oh, we, we, so the question is where? How how should we think about the boundaries shifting in in terms of um, cloud service providers and cloud architectures and so forth? Um, I, I think at this point. Uh, B building, uh, building a cloud itself, it's a game over, right? You have three guys, they're gonna spend enormous amounts of money building it. Um, uh, I, I think, uh, though, generally speaking, in our, in our business, value accrues higher up you go in the stack, right? More often than not. And so, if I were, depending on where I, were, I was on the stack, the idea of using a cloud or managing a cloud effectively and so forth. Okay, it wouldn't be my neighborhood where I played there because my guess is if, you, if you're Amazon or Azure or Google, you're gonna make your cloud easier to use. You're gonna make your cloud more efficient. I would start thinking about going up the stack. So, you know, am I offering uh, the ability to make smart business decisions? Am I offering the ability to, um, Think about how do I better communicate with a community? Uh, am I uh, uh, creating tools that business people can be more productive with or that consumers? So like up that stack is probably how I would think of expanding my world rather than meddling us in the territories where I have a competitive disadvantage and inherently it's gonna get commoditized anyway, right? So that, that's where I would sort of think about moving the, my, my business. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mike. Great. It was a privilege.